common grace. We must understand that God's material blessings represent His common grace and mercy to all mankind. Here's Gene to explain. Genesis 7-1, we read, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. Of course, he did what God said. God saved him and his family. And then the flood came to an end. And after he got off that ark, it says, Noah built an altar to the Lord. He took some of every kind of clean animal, every kind of clean bird, offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he said to himself, and here's God's mercy for all mankind. This is common grace. I will never again curse the ground because of man. Even though man's inclination is evil from his youth. In other words, I am not pleased with what man does, and my blessing is not an indication that I approve of what man does, but in my common grace on humanity, I'm never going to destroy the earth again with a flood. Even though they will deteriorate again. And they did, of course. They did. And I will never again strike down every living thing as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will not cease. God's common grace exists. For those who are horribly concerned about global warming, ought to take notice of those verses. I shouldn't, I'm not saying we shouldn't be concerned about the environment, but God's still in control. And God made some unique promises that He will indeed fulfill. And this common grace is demonstrated. Jesus referred to it in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew recorded, uh, For He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good. That's common grace. Look at the evil people out there that are benefits of His common grace. Everything they have is because of His common grace, even though they're evil. Even though people take advantage of the system, even though people lie and steal and, and, and uh, build people out of millions of dollars and take advantage of the whole situation, the only reason they've been able to function is because of common grace. The ability to think an environment in which to live and be blessed. Now, it doesn't mean that the curse still doesn't exist. Because when Adam sinned, in Genesis chapter 3, may I remind you that the earth will produce thorns and thistles. And it does. And you will eat the plants of the field, and you'll eat bread by the sweat of your brow. And we do. Until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it, for you are dust, you will return to dust. In other words, when sin entered the world, it affected the whole world. It affected everything. But it didn't destroy everything, and it didn't eliminate the good things that we still have from the Lord because of common grace. The important thing to keep in mind is this, in terms of us as Christians, because the world takes advantage of common grace. There are people that say, I did this myself. This all belongs to me. Selfishness permeates the world system. But the sad part is that if as Christians we need to be careful that we don't allow that to permeate our lives. And so the reflection and response question is, though many unbelievers simply take material blessings for granted, even take credit for their prosperity, and they do, how do some Christians violate the same principle? Now, look at principle 31 in 1 Corinthians. This is very clear. As true followers of Jesus Christ, we should be generous with our material possessions. Giving regularly, systematically, and proportionately. And you've heard the statistics. If you take all the people who claim to be Christians, basically it's about 1% or 2% of their gross income. Now, if you eliminate those who are just Christians in name only, 
uh, and you narrow that down to the to Christians who really give generously, there are a lot of Christians who give basically zero. Because it just eliminates them from the statistical field. Because if you have an average of 1 to 2 percent, that means that in that average, when there are some who give 10 to 20 percent, you're going to have people giving zero who claim to be Christians. And we know that's true. If you went in and you checked out their bank records, you would find that that's true as Christians. And so, what I'm saying here is that in this particular chapter, I'm, I'm teaching on the subject of, of tithing. And what I share is that even though we're not told in the New Testament that the 10% belongs to God, uh, if they gave 10% in the Old Testament under law, how much should we give under grace? So uh, I took that very seriously, but uh, I, I was teaching about being generous in this chapter in The Measure of Man. So this guy wrote and he said, this man has been very open about his failings and many of the other attitudes from the book, and I believe God is working greatly in his life and bringing both his wife and himself closer together. The point of this email is this, that during our discussion last night, he made the comment that nowhere in the chapter do you, Gene Getz, mention that you tithe personally. And this man said, I assured him that I was pretty confident that you did. <laughs> and that you wouldn't teach that men should be giving to the church if you weren't first practicing it. <clears throat> but he insisted we shouldn't assume it if it wasn't written there. So he says, understanding that giving is very personal. <laughs> By the way, Jesus didn't make it personal. We make it personal, but he didn't. It's very public, just like should be very public in terms of something, you know, that we shouldn't be ashamed to talk about, just like we live for God in other areas of our life. I told him I would send an email to you asking you about this. Are you, in other words, are you practicing what you teach? And they said, I'm somewhat embarrassed to do so, but from our discussion last night, I believe God is really working on him with a number of issues raised, including the two we discussed, giving and fatherhood. I'm looking forward to a time when this man will join this, his wife in our church on Sunday mornings, but I will encourage him during the times we're meeting. After Measure Man, he wants to do your David's book. Thanks for your ministry. May God continue to do beyond what you think or imagine. Now, at this point in time, I want to tell him the truth. I don't want to lie. Because there are a lot of people who teach one thing and do something else. Well, in this case, um, I said, Jim, <laughs> thanks for your email. And I appreciate your forthright question. Let me begin at the beginning. When I got married back in 1956, I brought home my first monthly paycheck ever from Moody Bible Institute. Needless to say, in those days, in no way matched what salaries are today. And if I shared with you what that salary was, you would say, gulp, did people live back then? Did, what, did you make enough to live on? However, when I turned it over to my wife for deposit, she assumed that we would tithe regularly, 10%, not off of my take-home, but on my gross. My immediate response was, how can we do that in view of our financial needs and the limited salary? Remember that, sweetheart? <laughs> she didn't back off. She did it gently. She had reassured me that this is what she believed that God would have us do. You see, I came out of a home background where I was not taught to tithe. However, when her parents were saved at a later date in life, they began to tithe immediately because of what they were taught. My wife grew up simply believing this is what every Christian should do. And I married her. Thank God. At that point, I, I'm editorializing a little bit here. At that point, I was convinced with her that that's what we should do. I struggled with that, but I said, okay, sweetheart, I agree. This is what we should do. I'm teaching at Moody Bible Institute, and now she's teaching me. Editorial. From that point forward, we have never missed at least 10% from our gross. 
Several years ago, however, because of God's blessing and since our children were all growing and through college, we got a raise, you know? You know what I mean by that. And we began to increase our giving and we now give between 15 and 20 percent. And now, of course, the challenge is I'm retired and I'm not taking a salary from my ministry and I'm giving full time, living off of my retirement income. How can we keep up giving at that level? We're working at it. And it's a challenge. It is a challenge. And by the way, now we're tithing off of money we already tithed on. Remember, know what I'm talking about? You know, you could rationalize and say, well, I already tithed on that, so I don't have to tithe on this now. You know? That didn't work with Elaine either. Okay. Now, this is what I shared with this guy. Interestingly, when our children came along, I immediately taught them what tithing really meant. I remember taking ten cents and laying aside one penny. I remember that just as clear as crystal. And then I took ten dimes and laid aside one dime. And I explained that this should be a starting point for those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Elaine's message got through to me really well. So now I'm teaching the children what she taught me. And this is the encouraging thing. Today, all three of my children tithe. Our children tithe. It's just not an issue. We simply modeled it and we taught it. And I remember, I'm writing to this guy because I want this guy who's asking the question to be able to read this email and learn from my story. Frankly, I believe that one of the reasons I said here, God established the tithe, is it's so easy to explain even to children. The challenge that comes is that we, as we grow older, one dollar out of ten dollars seems to be significantly more than one dime out of ten dimes. Right? One hundred dollars out of one thousand suddenly grabs our attention. One thousand out of ten thousand seems to deter many people from continuing to tithe. And of course, ten thousand out of a hundred thousand, you get the point. And that's why the more people make, sometimes, the less they give percentage-wise. And that's not what God intended. What He intended is, as the amount we make increases, the amount percentage-wise should increase. Not just the amount, but the amount percentage-wise. And you can read that in the New Testament. Now I say this, please understand, I do not believe that God spells this out in detail in the New Testament. We're indeed living under grace. However, in view of all that Jesus Christ has done for us, can we do less? then give one tithe to the Lord's work. This is a very valid question, especially since the children of Israel gave two tithes every year, third tithe every third year to take care of the widows and the orphans. In addition, they often gave free will offerings. And then I say, thanks for the question. And one reason I didn't include this in the measure of a man is probably because of space. <laughs> I do know, however, I share that story in some of my other books. And I'm hoping and praying that my story will help this man who's struggling. But one of the things I'm thankful for is I could tell the truth and I didn't have to exaggerate. 